been selected. There we go. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I just wanted to say hello to those of you that join us and to anyone that's gonna be watching this later. Um, feel free to relax, enjoy yourself. As I told the people that have already been here, I have a drink, feel free to drink along. Uh, it's Friday, let's enjoy Friday a little bit as well. Uh, so for today's devotion, uh, I just wanted to kind of share a story with you um, about something special and important to me. Um, and to start with, I'm gonna read a verse from the Bible. It's Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15. You have probably heard this quite a few times um, in your life. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. So the reason why I picked this verse for today uh, is the special place for me has always been camp, uh, specifically the camp that I grew up going to. Uh, it's called Briarwood Retreat Center. It's in Argyle, Texas. Uh, kind of right in the metroplex of Dallas, Fort Worth. And so it's kind of one of those awesome respite areas where you have woods and you kind of forget that you're in the city. Uh, and so for me, I never really wanted to go to camp. Um, my pastor, when I was in confirmation, kind of forced me to. Uh, she told my mom that it would be a great experience. And I told my mom, I don't want to go. And so my mom made me go, just like any good parent should. Um, and so she forced me to get onto that bus we drove up to Briarwood, and I had the best time I could have possibly imagined. Um, and so I thank my mom and my pastor for kind of going behind my back and forcing me to go to camp. Um, I remind them all the time that I was forced. It was not a you know, choice on my end. But the good news is I liked camp so much that I kept going to camp year after year after year. So from sixth grade all the way through my junior year in high school. And so in the high school program, we have what's called the Lyle program, which was the Lutheran Youth Leadership Experience. Um, other camps in the Lutheran Outdoor Ministry have something similar or that same program. It's basically for high schoolers to kind of learn what it means to be a leader, um, as well as kind of giving them the skills on how to be a counselor. And so one of the things that we do right when we first get there, it's a two week program, is we get together as a group with all these kids um, same age, some of you have known each other, some of them are just brand new people that you've never seen. I remember we had one girl that was from Abilene, um, which for me seemed ages away, but in reality from Dallas it was like two hours, and for me it was only four. But in Texas, everything is so far away, it's just ridiculous. Uh, anyway, so we get together, and the first thing we do is we make our covenant. We decide what things are important to us and what things we want to uphold through the two weeks that we're here how we want to treat each other. And so of course, the first thing we put on there is respect. We want to make sure we respect each other. We have honesty. Uh, we have caring about each other and looking forward you know, to having fun times and being there supportive um, and kind of capable accountability as well. So we have this and we filled out this uh, entire covenant and then our week went on. Well, my pastor's son, uh, he ended up being a counselor that year. And then Troy and myself, um, two of our good friends growing up um, in the church, we were in the Lyle program. And so we were having a great time. And then all of a sudden I thought, you know what, Troy, it would be a great idea to pull a prank this week. I think pulling a prank is just kind of what this week calls. Some of your faces are already looking like, all right, this is the person we hired. That's a great idea. Anyway, so we decide to do a prank, Troy looks at me, he's like, I'll do whatever you plan, just do the planning yourself. So I come up with a plan, we are going to sneak into the counselor's uh, rooms at night, and we're gonna spray some shaving cream on their window um, or on their mirror saying, you got punked, and that was gonna be it. That would have been the end of it, they would have woken up, it would have been great, ha ha ha, hilarious. Well, I had a moment of clarity um, during that planning process and after having told Troy that that was the plan and him being okay and on board with it I told the counselors that I would like to prank Troy instead and so we developed an even more elaborate plan to prank Troy where we were going to slam the window shut lock Troy in the counselors rooms and have them wake up and basically 
tear into him about breaking the rules of respect and everything like that. So I'm like, all right, I'm on board. This is great. Let's do it. Fast forward tonight. It's about 10 o'clock. I'm, I'm still awake. I didn't actually quite fall asleep because I was super excited and giddy and ready for this adventure. And I get out of my room and I walk into Troy's room and I wake Troy up. I'm like, Troy, it's time to go. Like, are you still down for this? And he's like, I, if Jimmy goes, I'll go. And I was like, all right. So I went back to my room. I woke up Jimmy. And I said, Jimmy, do you want to go? And Jimmy said, no. And so I came back to Troy. And I was like, Troy, Jimmy said he didn't want to go. Never asked Jimmy. Didn't want to wake up Jimmy. This was for Troy, 100%. So Troy gets up half sleepy, doesn't even put on his shirt, doesn't put on shoes because he thinks this is going to be a real quick in and out. And finally, we crawl around the back of the building. Um, these are motel style cabins that we were staying in because we were in the lab program. And so we, we climbed, and we got to the window for the counselors. And I was like, all right, Troy, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to lift the window up. I'm going to sneak in halfway. I'm going to hold the window up. And then you're going to climb through, and then I'll climb through. So I climb in. I put my head through. I'm holding the window, which perfectly could have stayed open by itself. Troy climbs into the, ca the cabin. I slide out, and I slam the door shut, and then I run back to my cabin. I have no idea what's happening at this point. I just know what the plan was. And then all of a sudden I get a nice little right on my door. Well, there's one of the counselors and they're like, do you have the shaving cream? And I was like, yes, I have the shaving cream. Here you go. So I hand them the shaving cream. They were gonna spray, you've got punked on Troy's mirror. That was it. Again, quiet, didn't know what was happening. I thought the plan was going down. I get another rap on my door. This time it's Troy with the assistant program director behind him, the counselors that were a part of the plan, um, and Troy is bawling and crying in front of me. So many tears, and he's just so upset, and he says, Christian, I have to go home. I'm getting sent home. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And I'm looking at the people behind him like, okay, this has gotta be a joke, right? Nothing, stone cold, straight faced, Troy's going home because he snuck into a counselor's cabin. So I'm sitting here panicking. I'm like, all right, cool. Then the program director, off in the background, he's like, Christian, can I come talk to you? I was like, yeah, sure, let's do that. So I start walking over to the program director. Now, unbeknownst to myself, uh, Troy had gotten in trouble, and they caught him in the cabin. Troy's response when they turned on the light and said, what is going on? Was to peek out from behind the curtain and go, boo. Didn't go over well. They drug him up to the lodge. They pointed at the covenant. They said, do you see these words? It says honesty. It says respect. It's a, and they're just going on and on and on. And then all of a sudden, the program director shows up. He makes a phone call to our operations director to get not only Troy's grandma's number, so that he can go home, but also to look up my mom's number just in case that I needed to go home as well. So this is happening, Troy's bawling, he's crying, he's broken the covenant, he's feeling really bad. He finally is like, all right, I needed to let Christian know that I got caught and this is not okay. So that's when the rap on the door happens. And so the program director, he's talking to me, he's like, so uh, Troy got in trouble tonight. And as you can see, he's not in a good uh, space. Uh, we called his grandma and he's going home. Um, and I just wanted to know if you had anything to do with this. Now, little voice in the back of my head said, oh, I could definitely say I had nothing to do with this. I was in bed, sound asleep. I don't know why Troy would do this, but I didn't. I took that accountability to heart, that honesty, that respect on that covenant meant more to me than it did to Troy. So I looked my program director in the face and I said, Yes, it was my plan. Troy had nothing to do with it. Also, if you need my mom's number, here it is. And so I gave him my mom's number. He walked over to the assistant program director. I walked over to Troy. We hugged. We're both crying at this point, just like, all right, we're going home. This is the way it's going to go. And everyone starts laughing. See, when you try and pull a prank on counselors at a retreat camp that are usually good with kids, they make the kids 
suffer for it. So the entirety of the plan was that the person that they called to get the phone number was just a ruse. They had looked it up previously. As soon as I had my conversation with the counselors, they had their own conversation about how they were going to flip this on each other. And so we're bawling, we're crying, we're still a little upset. And we're just kind of somewhat getting the grasp of what happened. They're still laughing. And so we then come up with a better plan rather than just letting it be the end of the day, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, this is it. We decide, you know what? Brian, who works there, he doesn't know what's going on. We would like him to think that we got in trouble and we're going home. So in the morning, we don't tell any of our Lyle friends, we don't tell anyone else. We pack our bags full of pillows and everything. And we take them to the dining hall and we sit in the side room. We're looking all real upset because we're about to go home. And Brian walks in, and the program director and the assistant program director tell him that, you know, we have something to tell him. And so we sit there and we're like, so Troy uh, and I got in trouble and we're not really sure how to tell you this, but we're going home. Um, and he just looks at us. He's like, well, I'm really disappointed that you guys are going home, but I'm glad you guys are okay. And he starts kind of misting up a little bit. And so I throw, pick up one of my bags and I throw them at it. And I'm like, can you help us move our stuff into the vehicle? And he catches the bag. He's like, yeah, sure. And then he, he's like, this is light. This is really light. He opens it up. Of course, it's pillows. He throws the bag at me. He walks out the door. He's real upset. A little, little messed up um, in his right, right? Because he just thought his best friends were going home. We had gotten in trouble. He was okay. He ended up being fine. Our Lyle friends found out the story, and they thought, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. These guys are the best prankers ever, not knowing that what our initial prank was and what ended up happening were two completely different things. We really didn't have any control over it. But that year wrapped up nice and smooth. The summer was great. The following year, because of this legend that had been told, this uh, creation of glory and majesty that had unfolded in this one night, there was a prank war the following year. So bad, in fact, that pranks had to be outlawed at Briarwood because everyone was trying to one-up each other and it just got way out of hand. But the reason why I wanted to share this story, one, it makes me look like a fantastical mastermind, but the other part of it is really that Briarwood has been one of those places um, that I've always found a spot of peace and calm, um, regardless of what storm I might be going through. And so I felt that it was important for me to share that today because since we're all stuck at home um, in our own storms, whether it's from you know, jobs or health or just stir craziness, um, as some of us might have, I think it's important for us to think about those places that we do have. So mine is camp. Mine has always been outdoors and at camp. Um, it's been Briarwood. It's been in the Hawaii camp that I you know, most recently worked at. One of the reasons why the drink I'm drinking is actually Hawaiian beer it's, it's one of those things, it's that solace of that peace of mind. And so for today, uh, I just have one quick question for those of us that have joined, and that is, what is that space for you? What is that place of solace, that calm, that presence that when you're there, you know that everything's going to be all right, even if it's not? So we'll start, and uh, Cindy, would you like to start for us? Absolutely. Um, thank you. That was a great story. <laughs> you, you get the award today for the best uh, Bible camp or church camp uh, story. <laughs> um, my place has to be the beach, um, kind of like you, you know, the outdoors, the whatever, um, anything nature kind of is my happy spot. My husband and I just went um, tried to go for a walk, but it was raining. I live in Vienna, um, and we were going to do our little four-mile loop that we have been doing since all of this forced at homeness. Um, we have a number of them, actually, but anyway, we were like, is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? Is it going to be really bad? Are we going to get stuck like we did a few weeks back with a deluge, and we were 30 minutes walking in the freezing rain. This was probably back in March, even. Anyway, whatever. But the beach is definitely the place, not only a place of refuge and peace and at one with nature and all that, but 
it makes me feel small. And sometimes I need to feel small. Um, sometimes I need to feel like there is so much more that's bigger than I am. And um, that's what I get there. That's what I've got. <laughs> Joanne, would you like to go next? I guess I just have to say my backyard. We have a beautiful backyard. Uh, and behind us is a 10 acre wetland. And we have bluebirds and pileated woodpeckers. And I just sit out there and I think, boy, something bigger than me certainly created this. And it's just so peaceful that I could just sit there. <laughs> Is it for you as well, the garden? The garden? Is it for both of no. you or is it just for you? Oh, the backyard is for me. Dave loves his garden. Okay. Dave, you're, you're the garden man. Well, we're just now getting the garden going, uh, getting, got the tiller running and got the first tilling done and we've got uh, tomatoes planted, now covered up at night, but uh, got some potatoes planted yesterday and a lot of more. Beans and stuff will go in soon. All right. And do you enjoy doing the work for the garden or kind of? I do. I think uh, gardening is one of the most relaxing things that I do. Uh, so a, a healthy garden plot is a wonderful thing. Awesome. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, like Cindy, same reasons for the ocean, but I will say right now when we start driving out of Centerville, you know down you know we go 29 but you can go 66 and you see the mountains pretty quickly um but as soon as we start heading um out of northern virginia I, I love northern virginia but when you you know sometimes it can be stressful so you start heading out and you see all that green and then you start seeing the mountains ahead of you and where we are in wintergreen right now is like there's just Blue Ridge Mountains and sunsets and sunrises and they're they're beautiful. There's no uh, light pollution at all, and you know it's dark and it's super dark at night and you can sleep better and I can hear the birds. The birds are so loud and amazing and so we're we, you know we're going on all these walks and we're listen, we're watching things bud and we're watching and we get to see we saw a black bear the other day the Appalachian trails down the street. I mean, it just makes you really appreciate. Uh, all the beauty that God has provided for us, you know, as, as much as you, I love the ocean too. It's just so fantastic. And the change of seasons are so prominent here. So yeah, that's, it's a peaceful place. Thank you. So for those of you that are joining us later on, so you're going to be watching this uh, at home possibly, um, I want you to think about that as well. Uh, what places are those refuges for you, those safe places? Um, and for today, I'm just going to wrap us up in prayer. Um, and then I hope you all have a great rest of your Friday. Um, again, it is Friday, so end of the week. Woo, that's always great. But if you don't mind, let us pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather, um, to share stories, and to hear about our places of refuge. Uh, we just ask that you let us be like children, remembering that there are those places where we feel safe. That while the world may seem big and out of control right now, it's still in your hands. Uh, we ask that you lift up those that are working on the front lines. Um, and as we continue to open up, uh, we just ask that you keep us safe, healthy, um, and provided for. We ask all this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining me. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Christian. Bye, Bye guys.